You're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Up next is Project Censored. Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today, we acknowledge the 50th anniversary of the beginnings of the war on poverty. We'll ask Professor Emeritus of Social Work from Ohio State University, Dr. Keith Kilty, was the war on poverty a failure? Also, author and professor Dr. Doug Orr joins the show to discuss his research, which focuses on the causes and consequences of financial crisis. At the end of the show, we'll be honoring National Whistleblowers Week, which is next week in Washington, D.C. We'll hear from one of the conference and summit organizers, Marcel Reed. She'll be joined by one of the whistleblowers of the recent VA scandal, Oliver Mitchell. We hope you'll stay tuned to the Project Censored show. Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today, for the first part of the program, actually a bulk of the program, we're going to be looking at the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty in the United States. We'll be hearing from scholars Keith Kilty and Doug Orr. Later in the program, we'll be finishing out looking at National Whistleblowers Week and the Whistleblower Summit being held next week in Washington, D.C., and Project Censored will be there uh, to receive an award. So we'll certainly have some things to say about about that near the end of the program. But here's my co-host, Peter Phillips, to introduce our first guest. Peter? Well, the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 was passed on August 20th, and that created the Community Action Programs, Job Corps, Volunteers in Service to America, Head Start, and a variety of other programs to really try to address poverty in, in, in the country. Immediately thereafter, at the end of August, was the Food Stamp Act, which, uh, you know, gave people food stamps around the country to, in order to meet, uh, to help them get, keep out of poverty. So the question today, and our guest is Dr. Keith Kilty. He's a professor emeritus of Ohio State College of Social Work, and he's a producer of a documentary, Ain't I a Person? He's also author, author of, of a number of articles. And the one most recent is 50 Years Later, Was the War on Poverty a Failure? Keith, are you with us? Yes. Hello. Hi. I'm happy to be here. Great to have you back on our show. Um, well, let's just get right to that question. Was the war on poverty a failure, as many people think? Well, a lot of people like to think that. And, of course, that was the argument at the beginning of this year um, when there were a series of columns in January by a number of different people that looked back on the war on poverty and the 50th anniversary. Of course, many of them, that was the conclusion they came to, uh, that, that poverty rates then uh, may have come down a little bit, but everything has gone back to where it was and, and that we wasted a lot of money on the, on the war on poverty. The reality is very different, though. Uh, if you look at the official poverty rate in 1964 when the legislation was being passed and then look five years later in 1969, the, the official poverty rate in the U.S. dropped from 19% to 12.1%. We saw those same kind of gains carry on through most of the 1970s until a lot of the programs were scaled back, uh, particularly after the beginning of the Reagan era in, in the early 1980s. Uh, so I, I, I can't understand how anybody could actually argue that the war on poverty and the programs that were created by the uh, LBJ administration were, were failures. Uh, if anything, they show that in reality, when you have big government and it applies itself, it actually works, which of course is contrary to the mythology of conservatives and right-wingers these days that, that big government can't do anything right. Uh, Professor Keith Kilty, you write 
write uh, in a piece called 50 Years Later, Was the War on Poverty a Failure? With a question mark. Well, you've obviously answered that, and we're going to get into more detail. But it's very interesting the way you start the piece with uh, Lyndon Johnson's State of the Union address, where he says, quote, Unfortunately, many Americans live on the outskirts of hope, some because of their poverty and some because of their color, and all too many because of both. Our task is to help replace their despair with opportunity. This administration today, here and now, Johnson said, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. Now, that sounds vastly different than the kind of rhetoric that we hear today. And, of course, the actions we see today are far less significant than uh, took that, than, than were undertaken in the Johnson years. Absolutely. Um, the, the spirit that... Uh, that the, the spirit that we saw at, at that time was really very different. Uh, of course, there were a lot of different social movements going on, and I think that that put pressure on people in Washington to actually do something. And we don't have quite that same spirit that, that things can change dramatically right now. But at the time, you know, the, the Civil Rights Movement was very active, which ultimately would lead to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 all part of Johnson's Great Society program, uh, which also included the, the war on poverty. There was a sense, I think, in the country for many people, uh, particularly those that were activists and involved in the movements of the day, that change could really happen. There was some degree of optimism. Obviously, not everybody felt that way, and there were critics of all of this at the time, too. But there was a strong sense that the world could be made different than what it was, that these problems uh, could could be, if not eliminated, at least reduced, and doors and opportunities opened. I part of the reason I quoted LBJ's uh, comments from his uh, from his State of the Union address were because of that spirit that he reflected. I mean, when since 1964 has an American president made such a bold statement that you know we need to open up the doors of opportunity for people in our society? If, if you look at the other programs, people think of the war on op uh, the war on poverty, the Economic Opportunity Act, but there were a lot of other components to it. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the telecast uh, of the uh, broadcast the Food Stamp Act, and where the the anniversary for that is August 31st. Uh, there was also the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and I don't know that a lot of people remember that, actually. Uh, that was uh, passed in 1965. The intent was to open up the doors of opportunity to ensure that low-income children, particularly those of color, had educational opportunities so that they uh, e equal to, to people in more affluent areas. Um, in addition, there was the high Education Act of 1965, and I think, again, a lot of people have forgotten about that. Again, it was the, the idea was to open the doors of opportunity for people who would never have dreamed of going to college. Uh, that created Pell Grants, and, and many uh, provided federal funding to colleges to expand, uh, to, to widen their, their acceptance of students. So the point is, there was this broad feeling that, yes, if we open up these doors of opportunity more widely in our society, then the problems we face, like poverty, like low income, like frustration, like despair, we have a real chance of doing something to change all of that. Now we seem to have stepped back from that and we we, we sort of say, well, we can't really do very much anymore. Um, and in fact, if anything, we're actually closing those doors of opportunity. When I went to college in 1964, so I'm dating myself now, uh, my tuition was under $300 a year. The institution I went to, the University of Illinois, their, their tuition now is $14,000. 
if I take that three hundred dollars and I adjust it for inflation, it's still only around four thousand. So it's nothing compared to what we have now. What we're doing now is closing those very doors by escalating tuition rates so that students can't afford to go, or if they do, they're going to be in debt forever. Instead of subsidizing higher education as we did at the University of Illinois in the 60s and 70s and 80s, where two-thirds of the cost were actually state subsidy, and that was true in most uh, uh, public universities. Actually, in California at the time, there was no tuition. So those doors were open. Now we're squeezing those doors closed again so that those same ch kinds of children don't have those opportunities. And it's their fault, apparently. Well, At least Keith, if, you Keith, believe, we, we, if, if you believe Paul Ryan and people like that. Well, we, we <laughs> certainly know that it's not the fault of the poor for being poor um, because there's certainly a surplus numbers of people over available jobs and the safety net programs and the opportunities that we started in the in the 60s have really been withdrawn in in, in many cases so well and, and there was a, there was what was unique and we'll, i'd like to talk about this a little bit about the uh war on poverty the economic opportunity act created community-based programs called community action centers uh these were funded by the federal government usually through the state and um were had poor people on their boards. I mean, the law mandated that there was maximum feasible participation of the poor. These were on the Head Start Councils. These were on the Community Action Boards. Um, so people got to make decisions about how that money was spent was spent in their communities and what was, was most needed. So it could be daycare, it could be child programs, it could be food and nutrition, a variety of different things. That created a number of new leaders in, in, in low-income communities uh, and kind of t changed in some ways the political processes in many cities. There were a thousand community action agencies uh, all over the country um, with people involved and they had money to spend. So it was a, a significant change. So kind of talk about that, the importance of that, Keith, and, and, and then what happened? The problem with community action organizations, uh, and I think one of the most important to try to remember now is ACORN, which was a, an umbrella organization uh, drawn from many of these. The problem actually, uh, well, not it's not a problem. It's a problem for those in power. Uh, the issue, I think, is exactly what you just said. It let poor people take part in the decision-making about their destinies, their futures. It created new leaders. It brought people out of communities who never had a chance to really step up and say things and be heard, to be visible and to be heard. That really put the fear of God, so to speak, into conservatives and reactionaries who, who never wanted that broad democratic participation in our society in the first place. And we've seen, particularly since the 1980s, a profound attack on not only community action agencies, but on public institutions through neoliberal policies, which essentially means privatizing everything, everything from uh, social agencies to education and so on, um, it, it, it's, it's pushed back. And those kinds of leaders that emerged in the 1960s haven't been able to emerge now because people are working too hard just to try to break even and, and, and stay where they are. We're talking with Dr. Keith. Keith Kilty, Ohio State University Emeritus Professor, a producer of a documentary called Ain't I a Person. We interviewed Professor Kilty last year about that documentary. He joins us again today on the Project Censored Show here on Pacific Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. Uh, Professor Kilty, you know, this is a, the theme here that a couple times has already emerged, um, and you write in your piece uh, that both major parties owe their allegiance to capitalism. And since the Johnson years, from Nixon forward, um, you know, we've seen this relentless neoliberal privatization uh, scheme. And Grover Norquist in the 70s said he wanted to drown government, uh, or I'm sorry, wanted to shrink government down to the size where it could be drowned in a bathtub. And, you know, in Reagan, the Reagan years, the mantra was government's not the solution, government's the problem. Uh, Clinton came in under a hope change kind of doctrine that gutted 
uh, things like welfare and so forth and, and gave us NAFTA and outsourced jobs. And Bush and Obama have continued, Bush second and Obama, they've continued that. Obama's merely recycled the hope and change rhetoric, but he continues to deliver uh, to the to the 1% crowd and continues to deliver the neoliberal policies. And you're saying that we can do something very different like we did 50 years ago. But do you see that happening at all within the confines of the two parties we have today? No, I don't think it's possible within the the context of modern politics. We have we 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 have we have what we call a two party system, but they both, as you mentioned, owe their allegiance to capital, to big capital. Uh, the only way you can get elected anymore is to raise millions and millions of dollars, at least at the at the at the national level. Um, if we continue in, in in that frame, you know, thanks to citizens decisions like Citizens United, it's going to be very difficult to bring about that change. Um, it's still possible to some extent, particularly, I think, if people work at the local level. What, what we, we have, I, I've seen in a number of states now, there are efforts at the state level to put a limit on how much corporations can spend on uh, uh, political activity and things of that sort. So um, we also... We also need, in, in, in addition to some awareness of how those who have wealth, the big billionaires, the people now um, like Adelson, where you have to to pay a, a call and, and kiss their hand if you want to have a chance to be a candidate in, the, in a particular party, um, I, I, I think more and more people are aware of that. If you look at opinion polls, people certainly recognize that. What, we're, what we don't have right now, I think, are the same kinds of movements that we had in the 1950s and 1960s, the movements for economic human rights, the movements for civil rights. Uh, they're out there, and there are a lot of people working very hard to do things, but we don't have the, the broad-based movements that can push from below to make people respond to that kind of change. But I, I, you know, I don't want people to be totally pessimistic either. I think if, we, if that's an easy way out, we can sit back and just say, well, what can we do? The times have changed. Yes, the times have changed. But this is the, the circuit. But that doesn't mean that what we did 50 years ago can't be done again. The point is that if we did it once, we can certainly do it again. It's a question of how. Keith, um, it, it the evidence now is clear. We we cut poverty in half back in the 60s, and now poverty is creeping back up to 15% nationally, which is really an underestimate the way we measure poverty in, in, in reality. We know that a quarter of the children in the country, 25%, live in, a, um, 16 million kids, live in a family that's uh, in poverty, meaning that they don't have enough money to meet their basic needs. Um, and then another uh group of children, up to 45% of the children in the country, are near poverty. Or they're, they're just barely above and barely have enough. And, we, you know, the, the, the food programs, the uh, food, food stamps and that, the AFDC, the welfare is gone. Uh, you know, it's all work mandated, required. Um, and that has created a, a very mean sense of what it means to be poor. It's your fault, and, and uh, we don't care about you. That seems to be the neoliberal approach, except that you should go out and work for the lowest possible pay and, and, and take care of yourself and your kids. Uh, creates a very mean situation, and it seems that we really need to move in a direction um, that addresses the realities of this. And, and what suggestions do you think we, could, we would have? I, I think the, the way forward again is to is to really encourage young people to take to take into their hands what they did 50 years ago. It was young people that were leading uh, the student movements, uh, that were leading the working class movements, that were active in the civil rights movement, uh, the welfare rights movement. All of these, we we, we need an, a fresh set of leaders to start uh, looking at the world from the point of view of what does the future look like for somebody that's 25 years old now where are they going to go what are their hopes what would they like to, to see the world to be um, I 
these are the these are the kinds of people I think that we need to encourage to speak out to get involved. We saw that to some extent with the Occupy movement, and I know it's still out there to a large extent around the country. Last year, when I the last couple of years after I finished my documentary, I was traveling quite a bit. Uh, showing the film in various locations and having a lot of conversations afterward. People are aware of this. I think the problem is uh, there's this sense that it's gotten so big, the scope is so big, and right now the wealthy have such domination over things at the national level that it makes it hard to look for for options. That's why I really encourage people to look at their local level uh, and at their state, their, their towns, their cities, their counties, and their state governments. This is where we can impact leaders in ways that, that make them nervous. Look at uh, Moral Mondays in North Carolina. Uh, as bad as the legislature in North Carolina is right now, it's not going quite as far as it was before people, thousands of people started to meet every Monday in that state. In Ohio, two years ago, uh, we had a governor who passed legislation essentially eliminating public unions, and that pr produced a profound backlash. And in fact, it led to a, uh, a ballot effort that was successful in beating back what was called SB5, the, the uh, legislation that John Kasich signed into, in, in, it through, it got through his Republican uh, legislation. So uh, again, it, it's, it's here where we can push the hard at the national level, it's more difficult at this point because of uh, the, the domination of the wealthy and the money and the media. Uh, people don't see things to the, way in, to the extent that they used to. But we do have the alternative media. We have the Internet. We have access to information in many different ways now. Uh, but we need that new set of leaders who see the world from a different perspective. You know, I was I was the new left in, in 50 years ago, and I recognize that now we need another new left. And while I want to continue to be active, obviously, and and involved, I want to see fresh ideas and fresh points of view emerge from the young people that are struggling to get by in this country. Uh, Dr. Keith Kilty, uh, it is in fact uh, the young people that are doing a lot of great work, and because of the lack of media coverage, a lot of folks don't realize how many changes are going on and right. of course the corporate media demonized occupy tried to or you know ignore occupy etc um you know tried to frame them out of out of existence and the interesting thing about occupy is that it, a lot of these people were already community organizers and working in, in in various ways in their communities and many of them have continued to work against the foreclosures and work in their communities for homeless people and so forth um so again it's you know certainly a project censored we look a lot at what corporate media do and do not cover and that's a big problem and as also as an historian you know a lot of the history gets censored and that's what's very refreshing to take these milestones here and these anniversaries to look back and remember what the the challenges we faced what we did about them because i think it's it's heartening and empowering for us and for young people today to see that they're not just tilting at windmills and it's not just their struggle and it's not the first time Exactly. I think that's a very powerful point. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I, I obviously uh, agree with you completely. Uh, there's so much going on around the country, and I saw a lot of that as I had that chance to, to travel for a while. Um, the problem, what we need to do is to find ways that we can interact with each other around the country to get those messages out more and more and more and to, so that people recognize they're not alone. Well, Keith Kilty, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. This is a very important issue to remember uh, the, the war on poverty 50 years ago, the positive impacts that it had, the kinds of changes that occurred uh, are very much needed today as we drip back into higher levels of poverty and inequality, not only in the country but in the world. Um, this is something that we have to remember uh, that we can succeed, that there are ways of addressing these issues, and they're not that terribly expensive. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.
Yeah, Peter. Peter, I wanted to just point out, you just reminded me something we spoke about earlier in terms of the, the war on poverty and the cost of poverty. And uh, Professor Kilty wrote in his article uh, that in 1964 dollars, it was somewhere around a billion dollars. He wrote that in the article there. To eliminate poverty. All the, I, 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 and nowadays, I mean, obviously, it's the, the numbers are, are far more astronomical. But when you look at the amount of money that we're spending on the military and on uh, U.S. global hegemony, you know, over $700 billion. That's just the Pentagon budget. That doesn't count the rest of it, the t- debts on wars and so on and so forth. And, and the amount of money today purportedly to end poverty in the United States is under $200 billion. I think that that's, you know, we could really improve the lives of many, many people, not only here but around the world. Um, and so let's move to our guest, our next guest, who's uh, Dr. Doug Orr. Uh, graduate from Columbia, Ph.D. from the University of Colorado, professor of economics at Eastern Washington University of Spokane for some 19 years, and now is teaching at uh, City College of San Francisco. Um, Doug Orr is the co-editor of the book Real World Banking and Finance, which focuses on the causes and consequences of financial failures. His regular contributor, Dollars and Cents Magazine, his most recent article is The Big Casino. How to rein in stock market uh, speculation. So, Doug Orr, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's just get right into this. And I mean, to what extent the stock market um, speculation, and uh, of course the recession that we just, kept, just coming out of, which is really the rich came out of it fine, but poor people didn't. Um, how, how are we impacted by what you call the big casino? On a day-to-day basis, um, most people in the United States are not positively impacted by the stock market at all. It has no impact on their life. Um, If you look at who owns stock in the United States, over half of the population in the United States owns less than $5,000 worth of stock, and a third of the population doesn't own a single share. Um, The top 10% of the population owns 90% in round numbers of all of the financial um, assets in the economy. So the stock market really doesn't play a positive role in most people's lives. But it can play a very negative role in people's lives when the whole game falls apart. And the game falls apart um, for various reasons. Um, the one reason it can fall apart is because the underlying economy is in crisis, and that's what happened in 1929 and 2007. Um, I mean, pe- the people think the stock market crash in 29 caused the Great Depression, but in fact, the Great Depression caused the stock market crash. Um, what was coming down the road, the people in the stock market saw it and tried to get out, and when everybody gets out at the same time, it all collapses. Same thing happened in 2007. Um, it was all, all of the other things were going on in the in the real economy and and in the financial markets that led to the crash in the stock market um, in 2007. Um, uh, Dr. Doug Orr, you, you did, I, I'm glad you started the discussion here by the percentage of people that are impacted by the stock market in the United States negatively versus the number of people that are actively involved in it in some way such that it is productive. I know uh, a lot of the people that are involved may be involved inadvertently through retirement and pensions, and and uh, which is another maybe possible casino game, <laughs> another topic for, right. for another time. Um, but I, I, I'm glad you pointed that out because when we tune into things like the corporate news media and we see there's there's just kind of, there's always a stock update, and, and, and basically in the corporate news media, even at NPR, uh, there's there's this assumption that because they update people on the stock market that that's their economic news. News, uh, even though that that news doesn't mean much to people uh, in the bigger picture, or in a way that they can understand it, because it's never explained. Certainly not explained how you explain the big casino in your article here. Yeah, um, I mean that's one of the things I mentioned in my article that's so frustrating is, as you said, even NPR, it's, it's in economic news. The Standard and Poor's did this, the stock, right? As if that matters, and to most people. They say, well, it doesn't matter to me, but it must matter to everybody else because they, they're reporting it. I mean, everybody reports it. So I must be the only one who's not involved. And that's the image that the corporate media wants to convey to people, um, that if you're not in this, well, that's that you're the only one and everybody else cares about it and everybody else is benefiting from it. The other thing that I find incredibly frustrating about the media and including NPR and I make this mistake in my classes because it's just easy to make, is 
I mean, I think the biggest propaganda coup of the 20th century in terms of economics was convincing people to call the speculators on the stock market investors. Um, because they're not. Um, to an economist, investment is really important because investment helps the economy. If somebody builds a new factory, that's investment. Um, you've created new physically productive assets. When you build that factory, you're going to have to hire people to work in the factory. That's going to give people jobs. That's going to give them income. You're going to produce goods and services that people might want, right? That investment benefits everybody in the economy, which is why economists spend so much time looking at investment. So when you build a new factory, that's investment. But if you, through a merger, buy a factory that already exists, that is not investment. That is simply changing the ownership of something that already exists. No new jobs are created. No new f assets are created. No new productivity is created. In fact, jobs sometimes decrease. In fact, almost always jobs decrease because you're going to merge these firms together and you need less um, staff and so you're going to lay people off. And so talking about people in the stock market as being investors is a complete misnomer because if you buy 100 shares of Microsoft stock from Peter, right, he's going to hand you 100 shares of Microsoft stock. You're going to pay him some money in a check or with cash or whatever you want to give him, right? But not a penny goes to Microsoft. Not a penny goes into the real economy, right? And so on December 31st of last year, right, the Dow Jones Industrial Index hit a new record high. And on that day, $200 billion changed hands, and not one penny of that $200 billion went into the real economy, right? So talking about record highs of the Standard & Poor's, which it hit yesterday, um, record highs in the Dow Jones Index, is about as relevant as talking about um, how many people won Jeeps up at the new Grattan Casino. Um, in terms of the impact on the economy, it's exactly the same. So when you say uh, the big casino, you're really talking about speculators who are playing money games, um, using computer programming to do instant stock trading that makes it look like billions and billions or trillions of dollars literally are being traded. But there's no new investment. It doesn't create new jobs. It doesn't bring about uh, betterment for most people in, in, in the country or the world. Exactly right. So t talk a little bit about how this casino really works. Well... We all have this image, because we used to see it on the news, of how a stock market works. You have people standing in a pit, right, and on the floor of the stock exchange, yelling at each other. Those are bids and offers. Somebody is bidding to buy a stock. Somebody is offering to, to sell a stock. And in the middle, you have what is called a specialist, a market maker. He's the guy that was standing in the middle, and you'd, he'd bring people together, point you and you, get together. You and you get together. Um, that's how stock markets used to work. They were incredibly transparent. You could see, you could hear every bid that was going on. Um, but there were people who gamed that system. And back in the late 1980s, we put in place regulations to try to keep gaming from happening. And what we did was to try to make it more electronic so that the human being in the middle couldn't game the system. But now you have computers. And it turns out that the speed of your computer is how you game the system. Um, and so the gaming of the system has completely changed. And you call this program trading? This program trading is also called high-frequency trading, mm -hmm. although it should, also, it should actually be called high-speed trading. Mm -hmm. But the, the standard nomenclature is high-frequency trading. Um, and in, they, it, in your article, uh, point readers to your to your article, The Big C Know, How to Reign in Stock Market Speculation, talking to Dr. Doug Orr. Um, in it, you say that this kind of trading, uh, is it that it accounts for, um, by 2010, you say that this kind of trading made up 70% of the bloated stock trading volume. Right. Because what happens is if we still have in our 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 heads this physical image of people and so to try to do an analogy to that um peter decides he wants to buy those hundred pair hundred shares of stock okay so it could be a hundred million shares right yeah could be a hundred million but we'll keep it small hundred shares of microsoft stock <laughs> so he hands a courier a buy order right that says i want to buy a hundred shares of microsoft stock and sends the courier off down the street to buy those shares of stock 
while he's walking down the street, the courier picks up his phone and calls his boss and says, there's going to be an uptick in the price of Microsoft stock because I have this buy order. Buy it first. And his boss buys the stock at the stated price, which is what Peter saw. But by the time the courier gets to the market, right, the price that Peter's going to have to pay is going to be a little bit higher. And who's he going to buy it from? The courier's boss. So the courier's boss buys the share of stock, holds it for less than a minute, sells it, and makes a guaranteed profit. That guaranteed profit comes directly out of Peter's profit pocket, mm -hmm. which is why all of the other stock market players got very upset uh, when Michael Lewis published his book, Flash Boys, because what Michael Lewis did was to illustrate that all of these players, Charles Schwab, T. Roy Price, right, these big players were being played. And the worry was the casino is going to fall apart if everybody thinks the casino is rigged. So you have to maintain the faith in the casino. You have to make it look fair, even when it's not. What that courier is doing is called front running. Mm -hmm. And what the computerized markets have allowed the hedge fund managers to do is to front run even really big players like Charles Schwab and T. Rowe Price. Once this stuff got set up, right, then it became something that Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch set up their ability to do too. And so there's been a, a fairly significant drop off in the volume of trades in the stock market since the publication of Flash Boys. Because there are all these people out there who are saying the stock market's rigged. Uh, it's it's always been gambling, right? And there are people who are gonna always like to gamble. But people aren't gonna like to gamble if they know they're gonna lose, right? Doug Orr, his new piece is The Big Casino, How to Rein in Stock Market Speculation. You can read that in the May-June 2014 issue of Dollars and Cents magazine. Uh, Doug joins us in studio today. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. You're listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. Uh, Doug Orr, you continue in your article. So we've now established that there's this big casino. Uh, and you talk about taming the casino, key steps toward taming this casino. And then you, you talk about something called a financial transactions tax. Yeah, the terminology that's been used internationally is a financial transactions tax. Um, I don't like that terminology because speculators are going to be able to use it in their propaganda to say, oh, well, a financial transactions tax, every time you write a check, you're going to have to pay a tax. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a speculation reduction tax, and that's what it should be called. Um, because let's go back to that, that illustration of the courier, right? He's, they're going to make their profit on that really small increase in the price of the Microsoft, Microsoft stock. And as Peter started to say, let's not talk about 100. Let's talk about 10,000 shares or a million shares, right? If you, make a, if you can make one half of 1% profit on a million shares, right, you've just made yourself $500,000, right, for less than a minute's worth of quote-unquote work a one minute of front running, right? So what a speculation reduction tax does is to simply say, we're going to put a tax on every transaction. So if you hold that stock for less than a minute, we're going to put a 10% tax on it. Mm. You're going to make a half a percent profit. If there's a 10% tax, you're not going to do that front run, right? But if you hold the stock for a day, the tax comes down to 5%. If and by hold holding tax, it for a day, what does that then uh, do? It's, it's trying to get rid of the front running, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we've, we keep passing regulations to try to prevent front running in various forms. And every time the quote-unquote entrepreneurs, you always have to realize that the word entrepreneur doesn't mean necessarily somebody coming up with a great new product. An entrepreneur is just finding a new way to bring money to themselves. Right? These people will figure out a way around the regulations, and they've done that consistently since the 1930s. What this tax does is to take the profit out of it. Right? If you put a regulation in place, people are going to figure out a way to run around it. If you simply take the profit out of the process, there's no incentive to find a way 
around it because yeah. you're taking the profit out. In your article, um, you cite the Center for Economic and Policy Research estimates uh, revenues could be between one and two hundred billion dollars for a half percent. Right. To, and I mean, just earlier we were talking to Professor Kilty and the war on poverty, and uh, in in the break between uh, guests before we brought you on, we we'd mentioned that. It, it may cost less than two hundred billion to help really seriously fight poverty in the United States. I mean, so two hundred billion dollars made on this tax could be used to, to el- poverty. Poverty. eliminate eliminate poverty. poverty. Right, that's exactly the premise. Um, and so, basically, what we're doing is we're talking about a tax on speculators. Um, that would get rid of something that is bothering people even as as high in the 1% as Charles Schwab, right? That tax, right, that would really be a tax on the top one-tenth of 1%, right, would be, generate enough revenue to essentially eliminate poverty. Um, just an aside, um, one of my earlier articles when I was looking at the causes of the financial crisis and the consequences of financial crisis in 2007, I was looking at the cost to African Americans of the collapse of the housing bubble. Um, and what that research showed was that half of all of the wealth that African Americans had managed to acquire between the rest- restoration after the Civil War in 2007, right? So that period of time, they're slowly getting wealth, mostly not getting it because of all of the discrimination in the housing markets and stuff. Half of that wealth was wiped out by the collapse of the housing bubble. And so what we saw was this huge uptick in African-American poverty as a result of this kind of speculation, right? The stock market speculation is only one tiny, tiny piece of all the speculation that goes on in the financial markets. All of the derivatives that were made out of those subprime mortgages is a whole nother part of the the crisis in the financial markets that need to be addressed if, A, we want to eliminate poverty, and B, if we want to avoid yet another financial crisis. Because so far, since 2007, we've done hardly anything to prevent a recurrence of what happened in 2007. So we're still seeing massive speculation in the stock market, whereby um, computer trading is so instant um, that we're talking very small percentages of profit made in just minutes. And there's a continuing uh, kind of adventure that happens in, in that way that kind of undermines the entire process. Um, and in fact, you could simply say continues to expand and create more poverty. Yes, exactly true. Okay. Exactly true. All right. Because if they are if they are cheating all of these people making bets in the stock market, you know, you say, well, it's no big deal. It's the it's the ultra rich, you know, ripping off the not quite so ultra rich. And if that was all it was, it wouldn't be a problem. So this is really a 99 but, versus 1% question. Yeah. And it's really 1,000th of 1% of these players at the highest level yeah. that are dealing with, you know, 100 millions of dollars yeah. in speculative buys. Right. And they're skimming all of this money off of people's 401k plans, mm-hmm. off of their pension plans, if they're, if they're lucky enough to still work for somebody who has a pension plan. Right. Those are the ones who are being robbed by what's going on. And these are also the people, um, Professor Doug Orr, that tend to say things like, people at the bottom don't work hard enough. Uh, and, exactly. And they talk about why we can't raise things like minimum wage when, when these people aren't working at all to make millions of dollars off of other people. Uh, it actually sounds quite scandalous and, if not criminal, certainly sounds unethical. Oh, it's definitely unethical. <laughs> it's not criminal, unfortunately, because Congress has passed laws right. to make every bit of what they're doing and legal. We know why, because yeah. they're directly involved with the financing of their campaigns from these people. And certainly a big question that we've addressed here in the Project Center Show, money and politics, uh, Lawrence Lessig, the 99, mile, uh, the 99 Rise uh, movement and so on, Occupy. So thank you very much, uh, Doug Orr, for your important research. You are a co-editor of the book Real World Banking and Finance. You are a regular contributor to Dollars and Cents magazine, including most recently the article The Big Casino, How to Rein in Stock Market Speculation. That's in the May-June issue of Dollars and Cents. Professor Doug Orr from City College of San Francisco, thank you so much for joining us on the Project Censored show today. Thank you for having me.
After this short musical break, we'll be back to talk about the Whistleblower Summit and National Whistleblower Week. Stay with us. You're listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular. But we must take it because our conscience tells us that it is right. And that is the theme of this year's Washington Whistleblower Week, National Whistleblower Appreciation Day. And we are joined now on the phone from Washington, D.C. by Marcel Reed, a whistleblower liaison, a former ACORN chair. Uh, she ha- Her efforts have been involved over the years in uh, resulting in major policy changes. Marcel Reed is one of the primary organizers of the annual Whistleblower Summit for Civil and Human Rights. That takes place next week on Capitol Hill, the week of July 28th, where the prestigious Pillar Award is awarded to First Amendment rights advocates and whistleblowers are honored. Marcel Reed, you join us by phone. Hello. Marcel. Peter, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. We are also joined by Oliver Mitchell, a Marine who worked at two of the largest Veteran Administration uh, outlets in the U.S., and he contacted members of Congress to report the abuse of veterans. Okay, we're waiting to get Oliver Mitchell on the phone, but hopefully we'll have Oliver, uh, a whistleblower himself, involved in the VA scandal who who outed that. But and, uh, we're going to try to get Oliver on the phone. But Marcel Reed, uh, this is the eighth year for the Whistleblower Week Summit. Tell us about this. Whistleblowers uh, in Washington, D.C., they would come to the city once a year, and it generally was to influence pending legislation, Um, and it was just a consortium of various whistleblower organizations and advocates um, who wanted to influence Congress because it's so necessary for society to work that there would be whistleblowers and that they be protected in telling the truth. Well, Marcel, just go ahead, Marcel, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, um, well, Marcel Reed, there is an entire week of this. This is uh, not only the eighth uh, anniversary of the Whistleblower Summit in the nation's capital, but this year is also the 25th anniversary of the passage of the Whistleblower Protection Act. Absolutely, yes. And two years ago, um, the Whistleblower Protection Act was the, the one of the seminal pieces of legislation that started to protect whistleblowers within the federal government who reported waste, fraud, and abuse. Because there is so much of it within the federal government and so little of it is reported. And very often it is seen as just a drain on the general treasury so that poor people who need the money, which has been the focus of the war on poverty discussion you were having earlier, are seen as taking this money and frittering it away and nothing good happens from it. When very often what is happening are that that millions and often billions of dollars across various agencies are just being wasted and um, a fraud and, and actual theft is occurring. And the people who stand up and speak about this find that their lives are ruined, they lose their positions, and they live for years with whistleblower retaliation. Well, Marcel Reed, we are also joined, uh, thanks to your connection, we are joined by a Marine Oliver Mitchell, who in fact experienced um, experienced firsthand the retaliation that can go on with whistleblowing. Oliver Mitchell, you join us now by phone. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Oliver, thanks so much for taking time to join us. Could you please tell your uh, our listeners your story uh, briefly about the Veterans Administration? Uh, sure. Basically, in a nutshell, beginning in 2008, I was asked to uh, further delete some records, which 
were in fact tied to some veteran deaths, which is spilled over to what we see the scandal in the press now, the manipulation of uh, appointment data and wait times. So, but all of this began with one of the facilities, which is the facility I worked at, which is the much like that was back in the beginning of 2008, all the way to current day. Oliver, can you, so what happened once you were you were being asked to get rid of documents, and uh, you're saying then that what you were involved in is related to the revelations of the scandals at the VA now? Right. Could you go into some more detail about what you were finding? Sure. Uh, basically, how it started was I was uh, asked to join the department uh, committee meeting, which is called system redesign, and the purpose of system redesign is to actually go in and fix the issues within the department. And the issue that we had was it started with the backlog. There were just too many requests for to see the doctor and they didn't have enough uh, slots to see the vet. So what they would do is every month with the appointments they couldn't fill, they would just delete them, which created a huge backlog. And they ended up with a backlog of about two decades. So at that time, I uh, we know now that my supervisor, the chief of the department, was under a lot of pressure to clear this backlog. And rather than work through the system, because we finally made a way to make it work, they decided to just get rid of the backlog. So when I protested and didn't want to be a part of it, that's when the, I guess you could say they circled the wagons around me. Oh, uh, getting rid of the backlog. In other words, not dealing with, not uh, not seeing uh, veteran patients. Right, right. And what what have you experienced as a result of of your calling attention to this injustice? Some people call it retaliation. I call it vengeance. I've received, I think, probably the worst of retaliation that I've probably ever experienced. I've been locked in a closet. I've uh, had my office or desk try to move to a closet. I've had employees threaten me with guns at work, and no one would do anything about it. I remember the day that I blew the whistle. They threatened to call the VA police on me and attack me with police dogs. So I've been through the gamut with, with the agency. Now, that's not to say, and I continue to say this, the agency overall is not a good agency. They just have some issues that they really need to fix because at the end of the day, it's all about the veterans and not about the agency. Certainly, um, that sounds like a, a really important story. Now, this was going on in 2008. It took several years for this to get into to the public domain where corporate media was covering this an issue. And there's been apologies and uh, say, well, we're going to not do that anymore sort of thing. Do you think that's correct? Mm, honestly, if you ask me, I think this in, the entire process is a sham. And I, I'm really disappointed at this because in 2008, I reported that the reason, even if you look at the headlines and the stories now, the manipulation of the data, the appointments, the veterans not getting their appointments, their exams, even waiting for disability claims, everything is tied into a veteran's death. And that's the number one thing that I found to complain about, which is why are the veterans dying? And there's an audio that was played on Fox News where the supervisor in question, you clearly hear us say, these guys are dying waiting on us. For me, at the end of the day, I don't care if it's a veteran, if it's a president, if it's a congress member. If you're dying in a hospital, but you're coming to a hospital to get care, there's a problem there. And this agency refuses to address the fact that we have veterans dying across the country. They're dying in the hospitals that we built for the veterans. That shouldn't be happening. And uh, Oliver Mitchell, the, the resignation of uh, Eric Shinseki, uh, Obama's VA head, you know, that sort of stole the headlines at the end of May and into early June. But it, it was this, it's a, basically it's a distraction away from your major point that you just made, that it's not about Shinseki. It's about the veterans. Right, right. And I, I think really that was, you know, that was sensationalism. It, it, it was all politics because you have certain people in Congress wanted someone's head to roll. They wanted blood. And you can remember for weeks they kept saying Shineski had to go. But he has already done several interviews where he even told Congress he wasn't even aware of many of these issues because the information did not bubble to the top. And I can confirm that because I myself have reached out to him. And I know for a fact that what I've sent him documentation-wise, it never got to him. 
it stayed in the middleman's hand, which was also part of this corruption. So the way to solve this problem is they need to allow senior management who's not involved in corruption to really get in there and turn this agency upside down. Because there's no reason why a bet should be dying behind this agency. Uh, we're spending too much money. Indeed. We're joined by Oliver Mitchell, a Marine who worked at two of the largest VAs in the country, a major whistleblower calling attention to the scandals at the VA. And we're also joined by Marcel Reed, who's one of the organizers of this year's Whistleblower Summit in Washington, D.C. And Marcel Reed, let's go back to you. Uh, I'll be in Washington, D.C. with our associate director, Dr. Andy Lee Roth. Um, Project Censored has the uh, honor this year of receiving the Pillar Award for four decades of of highlighting these kinds of stories and championing whistleblowers and First Amendment rights. Again, we're honored to be there. Could you tell us a little bit more about the week's proceedings and events? And I know we're going to be hearing more stories from people there like Oliver Mitchell. Well, yes, absolutely, Mickey. I wanted Oliver to come on with me today so people would hear some of the stories that the whistleblowers are telling. And more importantly, I wanted people to understand that for most whistleblowers, 99.7% of whistleblowers receive nothing for telling the truth except that their lives are ruined. Um, They lose everything that they have. And more importantly, the thing that pains most of us because... I'm sure everyone like I was given the same mantra when we were children. No matter what the problem is, if you just tell the truth, dear, it will all be all right. And these people are here to testify that they told the truth and all turned out bad. And that is the story that most of the time the news media does not want to tell. I wanted to speak very briefly, Mickey, about why Pacifica is supporting the Whistleblower Summit for Civil and Human Rights. Please do. We have, you... a, we have about a minute left, so please do. Okay. Very quickly. Um, it, it did so because in 2010, when I was a member of the PNB, I brought forward a motion that was adopted unanimously by the PNB to support the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. It is the first major media organization in the country to do so. Uh, and from that point forward, Pacifica has supported uh, whistleblowers and have participated each and every month. And this is an opportunity for those stories to be told on the Hill. Whistleblower Summit, we will, you will be receiving your Pillar Award, which is a great honor. We are giving it to people who uh, were strong enough to withstand, and Project Censor certainly has been strong enough to withstand the burden of truth-telling. Not everyone can, but you, mm-hmm. your, your organization certainly has. Um, there will be a number of um, um, events from luncheons to panels on Capitol Hill to the giving of the pillars um, out to congressmen and senators and uh, new media journalists like yourself and, and old media journalists who stood up and many have walked off of their jobs in journalism because they could not tell the truth. Um, I look forward to seeing you there. Again, congratulations to Project Censored. Um, Oliver Mitchell is a credit to this country because he stood up and told the truth and is paid with everything except incarceration and his life. And people who do this need to be supported. Well, Marcel Reed, we certainly hope to be supporting more the Whistleblower Summit into the future. Whistleblowersummit.com is the website. Marcel Reed, we look forward to seeing you next week. Oliver Mitchell, thank you so much for your courageous truth-telling. Sure, thank you. And, uh, Marcel, we'll definitely hook up with you next week. Certainly thanks to, uh, also Arlene Engelhart, uh, who is a big supporter of these, these events. Andy Roth and I will be speaking in the Senate building on Tuesday morning. We'll be joined by Christina Borgeson, uh, another courageous, uh, truth teller, along with many others. So please check out whistleblowersummit.com or projectcensored.org where we'll have all of the events listed. That's next week for the National Whistleblowers Appreciation Week. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you.
You've been listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. Thank you again for joining us. Our shows are archived online at kpfa.org, where the show originates in Berkeley, California. We're aired all over the country uh, the following week. We'd like to welcome a new station, KNSJ, in Descano, San Diego County. Thanks, too, to our producer in exile, Anthony Fest. Hopefully he'll join us next week. Until then, extra thanks to Erica Bridgman at the controls. Thanks to Junkyard Empire for their great theme music we want and of course you know what we want after today we want to end poverty we want to fight for truth and justice and we do that here on free speech radio and we do it together with you please feel free to follow us and like us on facebook contact us through projectcensored.org we'll see you next time Cause they own by special interest groups that fund their campaign That's why you hear the same old things they claim but change never came It's a dirty game maintained by rain for capital gain But my people getting tired of the pain and the shame We're not commodities or cars that turn the global economy We're the promise of a legacy, a spirit we're honoring An anomaly to those who can't imagine a world Without oppressive forces slaving for almighty dollar Ralph Nader wants to dismantle the corporate state. You there? Some of our clearest thinkers are Robert Reich, Cornell West. Louis Lapham now compares Nader to Thomas Paine because he knows what he thinks, says what he means, and is right. Nader's latest book is titled Unstoppable, the Emerging Left-Right Alliance to Dismantle the Corporate State. Nader will be in Berkeley on July 30th, a Wednesday evening, 7.30 p.m. at First Congregational Church, 2345 Channing Way. This KPFA benefit wheelchair accessible will be hosted by Harry Chrysler, creator of Conversations with History. Advanced tickets available at brownpapertickets.com and our blessed supportive bookstores. That's July 30th, when you can get with this nation's most effective crusade.